think back to your earliest scar, like that mark on your body that it, maybe you don't even remember how you got it. Maybe it's just always been there and you don't know what the story is. Or maybe it was something traumatic, like a dog bite or a bad accident that you had. So there are emotions attached to that experience, so you remember it. Even though maybe at that age you don't remember anything else about being that young. Uh, one of my earliest scars is a divot on my knee. And I'm not sure how it got there, uh, but something happened and it kind of took a, a chunk out of my knee and I've still got that scar. I have a sense that it had to do with an escalator in a shopping mall and uh, like I, I fell and it took a chunk out of my knee or something. I don't know if that's really the story or not, but that's kind of the story I've always told myself. Our earliest experiences leave marks on our bodies. Now, believe it or not, you have a wound, a scar that is probably earlier than that. That's your belly button. Like it's, it comes, of course, from our umbilical cord, and it was necessary as it was attached to the placenta. It was how you received nutrients from your mother. And yet, when you were born, it was no longer needed in that same, same way. So probably the doctor or midwife or maybe a family member cut that umbilical cord. And then over the next few weeks and days, it shriveled up and became all crusty and nasty and then eventually fell off, leaving the scar that you have now. Whether you've got an innie or an Audi, you probably don't think about it too much, but it's one that we live with now for the rest of our lives. Our early experiences leave marks on our bodies. They affect our bodies. Whether we're talking about scars or if we're talking about the food that we received during that time. Did we get enough food or the right nutrients? And that affects how we grow in those early years. But our early experiences, they don't only shape our bodies, they also shape our being. Our emotions, the personalities that grow in us, they shape our spirituality and our character. For most of us, many of these things come from our families of origin. Whether it's a biological family, or you grew up in an adoptive family, or a blended family, the different experiences at different ages as we're growing up, they shape us. Whether it was calm or chaotic, if things felt stable or like they were tumultuous, if you felt loved or if you felt isolated or probably some combination of these because they aren't black and white things. We absorb the experiences that we have when we're young. And that includes the rules that our families operate by. Sometimes they're specific things that our parents or grandparents have taught us and have spoken into us to make sure that we learned growing up. And other times it was just in the air we breathed and we might not even know that we have taken in these rules. For me, one of the first times I really realized my family had a distinct culture that was different from other families was when I got married. And those first years of discovering that were significant. You know, the families that we grew up in shape the ways that we have arguments or disagreements or discussions. They shape how we handle money. They shape how we approach sex. They shape how we divide the chores in the household. What we talk about and what we never speak about. Now, in my early marriage, my assumption was the way that I had grown up doing things was right. <laughs> and so my wife would just need to learn to do things the right way. And surely she would come around to that. Right? I live by my family's unwritten rules. <laughs> Now, there was a lot of pride involved in that. Fortunately, I've matured a, a little bit. But maybe you grew up in a pretty good family. You know, you, you think, well, my, my family wasn't perfect, but we had it a lot more together than other families I've seen. But that's not the point. Because none of us get through early childhood without scars. It's a part of being human. We all come from this family tree of Adam and Eve. Peter Scazzeri wrote the book Emotionally Healthy Discipleship and some others in that, that vein as well. And he points out that Adam and Eve's intent after they disobeyed God was to shield themselves and defend themselves from God and from each other. And today we do the same thing. 
in this broken world, we look to shield ourselves and defend ourselves from God and from other people. That shows up in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we are controlling. We want things to go just the way that we plan for them to go so that we can control the effects. Or we want to step in and fix everything. Or maybe we respond with fear to situations. Or we just withdraw and separate from them. We ignore the problem or we deny that it even exists. Or we pacify. If somebody's making a big commotion, then we do whatever we can to stop that. Or maybe we experience it through loneliness. Or anxiety. Or frustration. Resentment. Blaming other people. So many different ways that we respond trying to defend and shield us from God and from other people. Now, if you came from a family where you felt loved where things were stable and fairly secure, then usually it takes longer to recognize the shortcomings of your family of origin. It can be hard to be willing even to identify the ways that people in your family behaved or related to one another that maybe don't have any place in the family of God. Now, it can be easy for us to say, well, we're, we're followers of Jesus now, and so we're doing things better, right? We're part of the family of God. The scriptures are our authority. We trust Jesus and his work. We're committed to him, and we know that we are not the same as we used to be. We can point to concrete examples. Maybe you're kind, whereas before you had a sharp tongue. Maybe you don't hold grudges anymore. Or you're generous, whereas before you held on to things. But so often, those things that we, uh, that we have seen change are on the surface. But then we come to an experience that's really intense and we revert to the things we knew growing up. The way of relating and acting that we saw in our family of origin. Maybe this happens in an argument with your spouse or in an intense conversation at the church or with some difficulties and problems you have at your job. But we just revert to what we knew growing up. And sometimes our responses are more determined by how we grew up than they are by Jesus' ways. We need to move beyond the surface level in Jesus' work in our lives and allow him to work in our deeper emotions, and even in our past. The Ten Commandments are much more than just uh, rules that God gives us. They reveal some of his character. In one place in particular where he's telling us not to worship other gods, in Exodus chapter 20, starting with verse 5, he says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the parents, excuse me, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this can be a confusing passage for us in our culture. I mean, we understand God's love and we, we hear that love to a thousand generations and that makes sense with our picture of God. It kind of seems cruel to punish the children for the sins of the parents. I think there are a few things that maybe can help us understand this passage. One is the balance we see. Here, God's love and his generosity, it says that he shows that to a thousand generations. But the punishment, it only goes to the third or the fourth generation. This scale is weighted heavily in the God's generous and forgiving love. A second thing to consider is God's justice. Here and in other places, we often prefer to focus on his forgiveness and on his love. But God is also just, which means that the guilty will receive punishment if there's no change of heart. And in our gut, we understand this. Because we know that those who have done great evil deserve punishment. God is just. We also see here generational dynamics that are at work. The punishment going to the third and the fourth generation. 
in those days, it was common for all of the generations of a family to live together for their entire lives. So yes, the sins of the grandparents are certainly going to affect their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren as they live together in the same household. So we see both this this positive legacy that extends to a thousand generations, but it's also clear that the sins of those that go before us get passed on to children. Sometimes we see this generational pattern in the, the lives of people around us or in our own families. It seems like certain sinful behaviors run on in a, in a family for generations. Maybe you've heard someone say, yeah, she's got a drinking problem, just like her mom. Or, yeah, you don't want to cross him because he's got a quick temper, just like his granddad did. Here, we live in a, in a small town, and so we know people of multiple generations. And so maybe for some of you, you know, a family or two just popped to mind with those examples. But we also see these examples in biblical times, in the biblical text. Uh, by the way, just because something is in the Bible doesn't mean that it is an example held up for us to follow. We see messed up families in the Bible. So be careful when somebody says we want to return to biblical family values. Because not everything that these families families did is something that we would consider to be family values. The scripture for today comes from Genesis. It's chapters 12 through 50. Now, we're not going to read 38 Uh, 39 chapters together today. But in this passage, we see generations. We see Abraham and Sarah and their descendants and the ways they related to each other. We see Abraham and passing down to one of his sons, Isaac, and then to one of his sons, Jacob. And then Jacob became Israel and the 12, his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. As we see these stories, we see patterns recurring throughout these these generations. For one, we see the pattern of lying. It begins with Abraham, and we see two instances where Abraham says that his wife Sarah is not actually his wife, but she is his sister. And he does that in order to protect himself, and he says to protect her as well. Now, this doesn't make sense to the modern mind, does it? <laughs> that, that is not a healthy lie. And, and it's clear that in, in some way it did make sense in their culture. But it was lying. And then we see the next generation, Isaac and his wife, Rebecca. And we see the lying in their household as Rebecca works to trick Isaac in chapter 38. And then we see their son, Jacob, who takes this deceit to a whole different level. And he works to rob his brother of the blessing of their father. And he does it through deceit in partnership with his mother, Rebecca. And then the next generation is Joseph and his brothers. And we see the ways that the brothers, they planned to kill Joseph, but They ended up selling him into slavery, but then they lied to their father about it, saying that he was eaten by a wild animal. They went to the the whole uh, work of a sham funeral and pretend mourning for their brother as they lied to their father. This generational sin got passed from one generation to the next. We also see these family dynamics of of the parents having a favorite child. With Abraham and Sarah, it was Isaac. And so their other son, Ishmael, Abraham's other son, Ishmael, got left out. And then in Jacob and Esau's generation, they were both children of of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac's favorite was Esau, and Rebekah's favorite was Jacob. Not a healthy dynamic. And then Jacob then passed that on to his children as Joseph was his favorite who received this coat of many colors and the other brothers were jealous and conspired against him. We see this dynamic also of of a sibling rivalry that even goes to the point of cutting off relationships in one generation to the next. This pattern recurs. Maybe in your family of origin, There are generational patterns that you can see. Work to identify those ways that your family shaped you. 
maybe you need to make a, a genogram, a map of your family as you, you list out the different generations and you see some of the blessings that were passed down in gifts of character, in gifts of love, in gifts of serving. But maybe you also recognize those patterns of sin or of unhealthy behavior that you've seen in your own life that reflect what happened in previous generations. In order to, to grow in our walk with Jesus, we need to identify the ways that our families shaped us. These are, are significant major influences in our lives, and we can't move past them without recognizing them and allowing God to specifically work in them. See, the good news is we are not determined by our families of origin because God has adopted us into his family and we get to be reparented by him, by the good father. We've been born into the spiritual family. This is not just a, some theological language. This is a truth that God the father has loved us and has brought us into his family. Now, in order to be changed from the scars and the wounds of our families of origin, we can only be changed by a direct intervention by God. And we need change at the deepest level. Peter Scazzaro said, new roots are needed for there to be new fruit. If we are going to live differently, then we have to be changed at the deepest levels. And it's only God that can do that. Psalm 78 Give some, some encouragement for, those, uh, for the, the generation sharing the faith, sharing the stories of God with the, the next generations. Starting with verse 4. It says, we, they, they say, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders He has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel when He commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. We are now part of this new family, this first family of Jesus. And the good news is we have the best parent. It takes work for us to figure out what has shaped us in our past. But when we open ourselves up to that, then God, as the good father, will reparent us and mold us and shape us to be more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are good. We thank you for your blessings and love to a thousand generations. We thank you for our ancestors and the ways that they have followed you, the ways that they have reflected your goodness and the blessings that we receive now, even going back from thousand generations ago. But Lord, we also recognize the sin. We pray that you will break these chains of generational sin. Heal us deep inside as we recognize the patterns that have been handed down. And God, we pray that as you are this good father, that you will shape us, heal us, and make us to be more like your son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.